crowds can be very fickle things. One moment they love you. The next minute they want to crucify you. Such is the case with our Lord. (laughs) It can happen to the most perfect human who ever walked the earth. And if it can happen to him, it can surely happen to you and me. So we take this warning from Scripture and we lay it to heart in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, which says, The heart is deceitful above all other things, and it's desperately sick. Who can even understand it? And then the Lord speaks, and the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. That should scare you just a little bit. But what a blessing to know that even though we can be wrong, we can be misled, we can be deceived about the truth, we have a God who never is. He's never deceived. And then that that, that last part of verse 10 tells us that he gives to everyone according to our ways and according to the fruit of our deeds and our actions and our decisions. So if your deeds and your actions and your decisions are duplicitous, he will actually give you over to that. But if your mind and your heart are set on him, set on his word, and your, your deeds follow suit, then his favor, his unmerited favor, we call that word grace, is upon you. In either case, choosing good or evil, the choices we make manifest through our actions and are always seen for what they really are, inevitably. At some point, they come to fruition. And in and, and your heart concerning the Lord Jesus being either for or against him at any moment, will manifest itself in your life. You need to know that. The truth of who we are always manifests in some way. But sometimes actual evidence is not enough to convince the person of the truth. See, they can, they can see it, they can hear it, they can touch it and smell the evidence, but they cannot, or, or sometimes they will not, arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And the Bible tells us that some people develop blind eyes and hard hearts due to consistently ignoring God and his word. It's not a physical blindness. It's not, it's not a sight of the eyes. It's, it's the uh, inability to discern spiritual realities. Uh, and and it's, it's, it being in that state prevents a person from seeing and coming to the truth of Jesus. And just to throw, throw another layer on top of this situation, um, we tend to seek the approval of people rather than the approval of God. And and Jesus never struggled with that. In him, we have a perfect example of hearing the Father clearly and then only saying what he heard the Father saying. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And so as born-again Christians, he invites us to that same level of discernment that would direct our paths in, in, in ways of righteousness for the sake of his name and his reputation. And so all three of these problems that I've just delineated here in the introduction, um, they're all present in the text this morning. As Jesus is steadily now marching to Calvary, marching to the cross, and as we dwell on that this morning, I just think about how snippy I can get when I'm under pressure. Anybody else get a little snippy? uh, No, no, the rest of you are liars. We get snippy. You know, it's, it's just a matter of how much pressure it takes to get you to the snippy point, okay? But we're all, we can all get there. And, and so um, as I dwell on that, I think about how when I get under pressure, how snarky my thoughts are when I'm stressed. And if you're sitting here this morning thinking, my pastor would never be impatient or snarky or snippy, well, just talk to my wife and, and she'll tell you the truth. Um, and I am saved, but I'm still being sanctified, Okay. So let's, let's press into the text this morning and let's let God's word continue to wash over us and change us from the inside out. We're, we're going to start with uh, John 12, 36 to 50. So let's look at that text. John 12, 36. While you have the light, believe the light so that you may become sons of the light. And when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? See, light 
here is being used in the text as a metaphor. It's something that you cannot see. Did you know that? You can't see light. You can only see what light touches. You can't see it. You can't, you can't feel it. But by it, you can see what otherwise could not be seen. So in John chapter 1, if you go all the way back to John 1, you'll, you'll read these words in the, in the opening chapter of, of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word. And, and skipping along, it says, And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Some translations would say the darkness has not overcome it. See, light is a pervasive theme all through the scriptures. But what is light? This is, this is a lot of fun for me because I, 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 like, I like physics a little bit. I like physics enough to start to conceive physics, but then I, I, I just don't have the aptitude to go beyond that. But um, this is a, so much to our chagrin collectively, the very best and brightest physicists in the world will tell you this. Sometimes light acts like a particle and sometimes light acts like a wave, which is another way of saying, we don't know what it is. Isn't that funny? Something that's common to all men, something we all experience every day, we don't know what it is. We know how it behaves in certain circumstances, but we don't really know what it is. Humanity is not as bright as we think we are. <laughs> so we ask the question, what is light's relationship to darkness? And before I answer that question, I, I want you all to know that I, I detest the dark winters in the Northwest. Um, and what would otherwise be an incredibly beautiful place, when we, when we moved out here in 2010, we arrived at our destination in January. And so we did not experience the full winter darkness. And everybody was talking about sad seasonal affective disorder. And, and being a guy coming from Georgia, well, it gets cold in the winter, but it's still sunny most of the day. And, and so I'm, I'm just like, what's wrong with you people? You're just making stuff up. There's no such thing as seasonal affective disorder. Get over yourselves. Drink a little more coffee. You'll be fine. And by the second, by the full winter, the second year, I was apologizing to everyone. I get it now. I get it. Oh, <laughs> God made us to need light. Not just the sunlight to help our bodies make vitamin D, but we need the light of the world. We need Jesus. We need his word. And light in scripture is not just about repelling darkness, but it's also about revealing things. See, we, we suffer if we don't have light. This is true in the physical sense of light, and it's very true in the spiritual sense of light as well. In confronting and dealing with sin, the last 20 years, especially with men's issues in, in different churches, there is an absolute need to shine the light on sin. We need to shine the light on sin. What happens when you've got mice and rats? You shine the light. What do they do? They just scurry away, right? We've got to shine the light of Jesus into our own sinful hearts to see where God needs to work on us. And, and, and some, sometimes it must be dragged out into the light, sin, kicking and screaming. The power of the darkness is the secret, the hiddenness of a thing. That's what gives it power. And so when, it, when you drag it into the light, when you pull it into the light, it, it, then it can be dealt with, but not until then. We even use this kind of language to describe life here and now. And this world and this culture is a very dark place, we say, right? It's a dark place. So it's really deliberate and poignant that Jesus chose to, in the Bible, describe his incarnation and his arrival into our world with the idea of light. And so the light has come into the world. Amen? So, so John 12, 39, Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they would see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And here we have another reference to Isaiah. As the Lord commissions Isaiah all the way back in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 to 10. Here's the, here's the context. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, this is Isaiah. Um, he, he's saying, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? 
Who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, ooh, ooh, ooh. How many of you guys in, in elementary school ever made the ooh, ooh sound because you wanted to be the first in line? Yeah? Isaiah's like, ooh, pick me, Lord. Pick me. And, and he says, here I am, Lord, send me. And God said, go. Go to this people and say this to this people. Keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't ever perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. Make their ears heavy and their eyes blind, lest they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. He let them go their own way. Romans 10, 5 to 13 says something very similar. Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law. Paul says that the person who does the commandments shall live by those commandments. But the righteousness that's based on faith, in contrast to that, says, don't, don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Like, you're going to bring Christ down. Or who will descend down to the abyss to, to, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what, what does it actually say? Paul, Paul asks the question. He says, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. Saved. That's right. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all. He bestows his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. There was a mindset, an attitude that kept the Jewish people from believing these things. John 5, 45, Jesus said, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you. It's Moses, the one on whom you have set your hope. They were still clinging to the law for their righteousness. But the law could never save anyone. It was never meant to. It was only given to show us our inability to please God so that we might trust in grace rather than in our works. So John 12, 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed on Jesus, but because of the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. And here's the kicker, verse 43, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They wanted to be seen as important in the eyes of people instead of important in the eyes of God. So many men who are in positions of authority, actually were believing on Jesus as the Messiah, but they feared the Pharisees more than they feared God. And it just goes to show, you can have all the right information and still miss it. You can still miss it. Either they feared man more than they feared God, or they loved the glory of man more than they loved the glory of God, but in either case, they were off the path. You and I have to act on the information that's available to us in the Bible and follow Jesus publicly and not shrink back. Don't make the same mistake that these, that these Jews made in this moment. Don't shrink back in fear. Verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me Seize him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, this is the first coming. That doesn't apply to the second coming. Hold on. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world at this time, insert there, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. Who's the judge? The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. 
For I have not spoken in my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Coming straight from the Father through the Son to you and me. Jesus is the light of the world. <clears throat> if you go back to John chapter 8, you'll see this, this discourse with Jesus in, in chapter 8, 12 to 18. J Jesus spoke to them, to the crowd, saying, I, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself, so your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, well, even if I bear witness about myself, my testimony is still true because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going and you don't know where you're from or where you're going. You're judge, you judge according to the flesh, but I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, Jesus says, my judgment is true for it's not I alone who judge, but it's I and the Father who sent me. So it's, it's your, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. And I just said, look, I, I, I'm coming to you with the truth, and my Father sent me with the truth, and so what are you going to do about that? He says, in your law, it's written the testimony of two is true. I'm the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So Jesus is the light of the world. The psalmist says something very similar in Psalm 119, verse 105, where he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But not only is Jesus the light, he's also the judge. And when I present that, somebody will inevitably, uh, in, in the past, this happened many times, <coughs> someone would inevitably text me or email me the passage where Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world. I came to save it. And what they meant by that out of context was, see, we can just, we just go along our, our little way and do whatever we want to do, and ju Jesus is not going to judge us. I said, I'd love to have coffee with you and straighten you out. Can we, can we talk? I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. What is Jesus saying? Well, th that's true. In his first coming, in his advent, in his revealing, he came to present himself as the offer of salvation, but... But Jesus will come again, and at that time, he will judge the world according to righteousness. In fact, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Paul says, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we're still at home in this body, while we're still living in these, in these bodies, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We're going to stand in judgment. Not are you going to hell or are you coming into heaven but you can just stand in judgment for your stewardship of what God's given you. So Christians are going to be judged? Yeah. Yeah. So the Father told Jesus what to say. And then Jesus spoke these words to us. That had to be the case. It was the only way. For any single one of us fallen human, be human beings to, to listen audibly and hear the words of God being spoken audibly would cause our hearts to fail us. So there had to be an intermediary. There had to be a fully human God-man to, to, to relay to us what God the Father was saying or it would have just killed us, okay? And so, um, and God will judge humanity according to his righteousness. The Father sent the Son to tell the truth and to warn us about the coming judgment. The words that Jesus spoke from the Father are words of life. They are eternal life. And all one needs to do is simply ask in prayer for forgiveness and salvation, and God will grant it. That's so crazy. There's nothing you have to do but ask for it, and he gives it freely. And whatever we need in the church to follow through on God's mission in our lives, the only thing we need to do, you know what it is? 
Well, we need to write it out in triplicate and then mail it to heaven and wait for six weeks. And no, we just need to ask. We just need to ask the Lord. Lord, we need this. We, we need this thing to, to, to continue the mission that you've, you've put us on. Help us. Provide for us. So good. He's so good. There, there's, there, was, there was much to parse out in John's gospel. So, we, so we're leaving John's gospel in the harmony here. We're, we're in Matthew now, Matthew 21, parallel passage. Matthew 21, 21 and 22. And so Jesus answered them. And he said, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree. Now, do you remember the fig tree thing? A couple of chapters back. Okay, they came into town. Jesus saw the fig tree. He knew that it wasn't time for figs, but he, he went over to the fig tree. There were no figs. It was just leafy. And he cursed the fig tree and the fig tree immediately withered. What was that about? That was a, that was a picture of national Israel and their failure to recognize their Messiah, right? Okay, so, so Jesus answered them, Matthew 21, 21 and 22. Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it if you have faith. See, Jesus says to us, have faith and don't doubt. Yet we're, we're very often given over to our fears and doubts. See, you and I need to always be continually asking the Father in prayer for what we need today. Not what we need tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. You may not be here tomorrow. You can lay your head down on your large pillow tonight and, and not pick it up again in the morning. You ask for today. God's word tells us tomorrow has enough worries for itself. So don't focus on tomorrow. Just be focused on what's before you today. Have faith. Trust in God's goodness. Walk in obedience to his word. It's not as if God stopped being God in order to serve us. No, it's not something that's beneath him. We fail to apprehend that he is both the most magnificent and humble being in existence. We just can't reconcile those two things. We just chew on that this week. He is the most magnificent and humble being in existence. But neither does he give us everything we ask for. <laughs> because sometimes I don't even know my own motives. Or the things that I'm asking for are not things that I really need for the mission. The things that I need, or, or, or need in quotation marks, I, I want for me. And he's like, no, I'm not about that. I'm about the mission. He does supply everything that we need according to his riches and glory so that we can carry out the mission. So our prayers must align with his will, not the other way around. We don't realign God's perspective with our prayers. Lord, I, I could really use a million dollars this week thinking about what all I could buy with that. And wouldn't that glorify you, Lord? And he's like, no, it would actually set you on a bad path. <laughs> we, 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 we work according to his will. We stay within the confines of his mission. And so he, he does supply everything we need according to his riches and glory so that we can carry out the mission. So our prayers align with his will, not the other way around. He's not the cosmic genie in the sky that grants our wishes. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the Lord of all. And so, so lastly, we come to Peter's telling here, written down by Mark, and we're in Mark 11, 21 to 25, this third passage in our, in our harmony today. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, hey, look, 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 the fig tree that you cursed, it withered. And Jesus answered and said, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, whatever you, whatever you believe on that, you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, 
so that your Father who's in heaven may forgive you for your trespasses. Keep a clean slate. Forgive people. But Peter gets all excited because that's what Peter does. He's, he's, he's got the heart of a 14-year-old kid, right? He's just like, oh, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go, all right? And so he's like, Rabbi, look, look, the fig tree that you cursed, it, it withered. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that fig tree is a symbol of national Israel. That fig tree will come back to life again. In fact, it already has partially. In 1948, now previously, I think it's probably four or five weeks ago, I misspoke and said 1973, which was the Yom Kippur War. But Israel became a nation again in 1948. And Israel is budding again, though it is not producing fruit in keeping with repentance. Yet. Yet. But it will. And we will all see it in the days ahead. That withered, gnarled fig tree has been dormant for so long and then it began to come back to life. And now it will face a great conflict from without and within. But God is with her. The Jews are not perfect. I don't think anybody really needed that information. They have not largely recognized their true Messiah. But you see, God has not abandoned them. He hasn't abandoned them. Just as Peter excitedly pointed to the withered fig tree, we should be excited about God's redemptive plan, which includes Israel. That fig tree will bud, but the fruit will not be seen, I believe, until the time of Jacob's trouble, what we call the seven years of tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. I don't think we'll see the fruit come on the tree until then. And then in the millennial reign of Christ, that same fig tree of Israel will flourish once more. It will. But all of this that we're talking about this morning points us to take our stand on God's word, to believe on what he's already said in his word. You see, so many Christians today are desperately seeking for a word from God. Just, I just need a fresh word from the Lord. How many times have you read through your Bible? Never? Okay, start there. Just start there. So many Christians, Christians today just so desperately seeking a word from God, going from church to church to church to church, and, 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 and even, uh, even just in the last couple of months, hearing stories about different Christians delving into Kabbalah and the occult out of desperation. I see Christians going to yoga and transcendental meditation. I see Christians going to tarot cards and Ouija boards. And these are people who call themselves Christians and, and then the whole litany of other false and empty sources of life and knowledge. Is God not enough? Is the Bible not sufficient? Do not be deceived. I encourage you, pick up your Bible, read it daily. What, what has God already said in his word? If you don't know, go find out. See, we're so caught up in wanting God to say something to us, we give a hard pass on reading what he's already said. I just need a new word. You don't know the old word. We're so hung up on, on just wanting God to do, do something cool. It's like, just, just read his word. We need to be a people of prayer, asking and believing without doubting so that God can and will supply all our needs, not all our wants, all our needs according to his riches and glory. And so take Mark eleven twenty five 25 to heart. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, and whenever you stand, you stand there praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, forgive so that your father who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. See, this isn't so much about that conflict that you have with your neighbor or your second cousin or whoever it is. It's about you and God, because when you start isolating people and cutting them off, you're actually you're actually running into a conflict with the Lord. And he's like, that's not, that's not how I operate. And that, this is not how I want you to operate, especially if you're selfish motives. And you got to reconcile. You got to reconcile this. We get so hung up on wanting God to talk to us. We don't even read what he's already said. But as his blood-bought people, we need to read his word. And we need, we, we need to be a people of prayer. 
We need to be asking the Lord and believing without doubting that God can and will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. So, so again, Mark eleven twenty five. 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive. Make that your first priority. Who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive? And if, and if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who's in heaven will forgive your trespasses. See, you can't go forward with the Lord in relationship when you're holding a grudge against somebody else. So what do we, so what do, we what do we do with all this? This is like skipping around and the, the Gospels and how does this apply to us? What does this mean for us? Well, as for Israel, God's plan for her is not abated, again, as, as, as some would have us believe, nor have the events of the past or the punishments and persecutions of the Jews that they've endured negated in any way God's covenant promise to Israel. Too many careless Christians confuse God's punishment and discipline with him having abandoned his covenant people. That's not true. Those who enter into covenant with God may indeed fail to keep their covenant with him, but God never breaks his covenant. Never. He is a covenant-keeping God. And to assert that he does not keep his covenants is to impugn his character in a way that you do not want to be responsible for. This is precisely what makes replacement theology so reprehensible. It is the idea... Um, well, and so let me back up. Um, we have not, again, we've not replaced Israel as believing Gentiles. We have been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. We don't really understand commonwealth, but think about the UK, a kingdom, a country that has other states, if you will, as part of its conglomeration and even for a long time, Canada was part of the crown, right? And so it's a, it's a bigger thing than just a state. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger idea. It's a commonwealth. And in fact, this is precisely what Romans 9 through 11 is, is about, incidentally. Because our, our, our loving, well-intending Calvinistic brothers and sisters think it's about God's choice or his election unto salvation for some and damnation for others but they've missed the forest for the trees. It's not about election to salvation at all. It's about God's election or his choice as to who he will use as his servants. And regarding that issue, he has chosen the nation of Israel. They are the ones who serve him. They are the ones through whom he brought the word to the world. They've served the world. So it's about God's choice, his election unto service. And just to clarify this further, let's make some distinctions between the church and Israel. The church was born at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Israel was born all the way back in Exodus 4. Not the same. <laughs> Long period of time. Both entities have different origins, have different missions, have different destinies. And as you read the New Testament, you can see the Apostle Paul specifically identifying three groups of people in his epistles, his letters. He talks about the Gentiles. He talks about Israel, the nation of Israel, and he talks about the church. And after Revelation chapter 4, the distinction is no longer made in Scripture because the church has been raptured and the bride of Christ is caught up to be with the Lord. And from that point forward, it's just the Gentiles in Israel. <laughs> Israel is mentioned 75 times in 73 verses in the New Testament, and every single one of them refers to the nation that God established, not as a replacement for Israel. The Lord gives one set of promises to Israel. He gave a whole set of promises that were different to the church. They are not interchangeable. Israel's promises are all temporal. So were their punishments. But the church's promises are eternal in nature. Why would any Christian want to change out for that? The promises to the church are eternal. I'm not, I'm not trading for that. All, all this will happen, but not until after the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. See, God's plan for Israel marches on. And though her situation right now is tenuous, God has a plan, and it is set in motion. No events of the past, nor the punishments and persecutions of the Jews that they've endured have negated in any way God's covenant promises to Israel. Too many Careless Christians confuse God's punishment and discipline 
with him having somehow abandoned his covenant people. And, and I know I keep harping on this, but it's such an egregious error to make, and I don't want any of you to accidentally stumble into that kind of thinking. See, to those who enter into covenant with God, they may fail indeed to keep their covenant with God, but God never fails to keep his covenant with them. And it's always indicative of God to keep his covenants. Humans always fail at keeping their covenants. So, so to assert that he, he does break his covenants is to impugn the character of God in a way that you just don't even, you don't want to be responsible for that. And, and, and again, that's what makes replacement theology so reprehensible. We have not replaced Israel as the church. We have been grafted into the tree. And, and, and again, this, read Romans 9 through 11, uh, dump the Calvinistic interpretation and just read it for what it says. That's, this is about being grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. So since the offer of salvation is clearly to go to all people, we know that from Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Acts 1.8, uh, restatement, restating of the Great Commission, there has to be, think about this, there has to be payment made on behalf of those to whom that well-meant offer of salvation comes. Otherwise, if, if there's not provision made for them to be, a, be able to be saved, then the offer of salvation is what? It's empty. It's disingenuous, right? So, so think about this. Stri strive to understand what I'm about to say. And if you want to talk about the consequences of this truth, I'm happy to do that this week over coffee. Um, if payment for sin has not been made for everyone, not, not partial, all. If payment for sin has not been made for all men, women, boys, and girls, then we cannot sincerely say that God offers salvation to all. I'm not going out the door with that. Oh, well, I, I'd like for you to be saved, but I'm not really sure you're one of the elect. I, don't, I just... Did you know if you believe that way and you preach to a crowd of 10 people, you're lying to somebody. Well, you can respond to the gospel. Wait, no, well, no, actually, all of you can't respond to the gospel because God hasn't already chosen you from eternity past to respond to the gospel. That's crazy to me. That's crazy to me. You can't even fall back on the notion that, well, we don't know who God's elected and who he hasn't elected, so we just preach the gospel and let him sort it out. No. No, you would be lying to many who hear the gospel appeal if you believe that God's already picked his team in advance. You'd be lying. If Christ's atonement is limited, then we are misrepresenting Christ and when we tell people that they can respond to the gospel. Because in that scenario, some of them can't. But since we are commanded to preach the gospel to all people as Christ's ambassadors, the unlimited atonement sacrifice of Christ renders this offer of salvation fully and uncompromisingly genuine. It's genuine. And that's the message we preach. And what I'd like to do is just to wrap up this section of the Harmony of the Gospel with a responsive reading this morning. We haven't done this in a while, and it feels, some of you guys grew up in bigger churches, you know, like um, Presbyterian and, and other denominations that had, you know, call and response stuff. Um, I, I grew up in a Baptist church. Call and response was a little more loosey-goosey. But um, I, I want us to do this this morning. What I'm going to do is um, read a passage, and then we'll all say the words on the screen together as we respond to the passage. And so Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. We thank you, Father, for sending the light into the world. We once were in darkness, but now, by grace, our eyes have been opened, and we have come into your light. John eight twelve. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
God's light is more than substance, more than an idea. God's light is a person, and our God has made his light known to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him. Brothers and sisters, the hour is late and Jesus is coming. Will you go to the lost with the gospel? You don't have to go to Burma or Cambodia or Nepal. You can simply go to your barista at your favorite coffee stand. You can bring Jesus to the bagger in your grocery line. You can talk to him about, uh, talk to your neighbor, talk to your mechanic. Wherever you go this week, make Jesus known. The hour is late. Our commission compels us to go tell. Will you walk in obedience? Will you act in faith? Emmaus Road Church, you are sent. Thank you.